Thank you very much and welcome, dear friends and colleagues. Thank you for joining us today for the Global Landscapes Forum, the investment case. Welcome back. Last year we started a journey that is of fundamental importance. That's the journey to close the gap between farming, forestry, small businesses in the world's landscapes with investment capital at scale. And to me, this closing this gap and, and the, is an obvious opportunity for the sustainable future that we owe our children and future generations. So here, in the finance capital of the world, we should really feel that pressure. So again, you're, you are most welcome. Now, to set the stage a little bit for today, Every day we put 100 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because we burn too much fossil fuel. This is a problem. It's a serious one. And with Paris behind us, we will increasingly and more seriously address it. But climate change is not the only challenge we face, even though we are sometimes led to believe that by the media and others, particularly here in the global north. And those other challenges, I'm not talking about Brexit or the refugee crisis, the US election or any other housing market bubbles. No, I'm talking about the well-being of everyone, the future we want, a future that is prosperous, healthy, fair, green, hopeful, and to quote James Cameron from last year's forum, full of love, love reason, and good powers. And, of course, one of the obstacles to create that world is that we address one problem at a time, sometimes assuming that central decisions and regulations will be the main driver of change. But change happens locally. Changes are different and diverse. Change is holistic, and above all, change should be based on opportunity, not on avoiding problems. So let's think about opportunities. Let's talk about opportunities. Every day, also, photosynthesis in the world's landscape binds 1,500 million tons of carbon dioxide. We hear a lot about the problem with the 100 million, but preciously little about the opportunities of the 1,500 million. Why do I say that? Because this is the starting point of all those value chains that our future depends on. I'm talking about sustainable value chains for food, feed, fiber, fuels, medicine, new bioeconomy products, and for services, indirect services, like water, hydroenergy, health, local climate regulation, air quality, recreation, even peace of mind. So much of our future livelihoods depend on these value chains that start in landscapes, depends on making them sustainable, equitable, sufficient, understood, and appreciated, and profitable. So not only do landscapes provide us with our biggest chance to fix climate change, they also provide the bulk of opportunities for sustainable development. This is the investment case, and that's why we're here. So I'd like to give you a few, an ABC of the meeting as I see it. We need to be ambitious. We need to give opportunities to billions of people. That's an ambition. We need to invest trillions, not billions. That's the ambition level. We need to improve the conditions for small landscape businesses everywhere. We need to include all products, all value chains, and all markets. We need to think big. That's the ambition to me. And we need to be brave. We need courage to go outside our comfort zones. Some feel comfortable that public grant funding will provide the solutions that we define centrally. Others are comfortable with the, the neoclassic capitalism where values are expressed in monetary terms, even the ecosystem ones. And for others, they feel comfortable in ideological discourses that may block solutions out of principle. We need to move out of those comfort zones. 
And that's the philosophy of the Global Landscapes Forum, to bridge academic disciplines, expert communities, and economic sectors, and create a forum where everybody talks to everybody and cross the traditional boundaries and innovate. And C, I think, is as important, clarity. We need to keep it simple. Everyone needs to understand and agree on where we're going, not just of us, those of us in this room. And as an example, how do we measure progress beyond capital returns? There's a lot of discussions about that, but how can we express that in a clear and simple way? Well, we can't really do that with hundreds of politically inspired indicators. We've seen those. We might be able to do it if we agree on a small set of value propositions. We need to figure out which those are. And in doing that, we need to embrace complexity, but without making it complicated. Think about that. We need to embrace complexity without making it complicated. That's the key for keeping it simple and be clear. So, just to round off, I would like to thank the Royal Society for hosting us, all of the partners that have invested in today's forum, and all of you for coming today and making this journey successful. Again, most welcome. So let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Peter, for that inspiring introduction. It's a real honor for me to, to be in this role, moderating this opening plenary session. I think my main qualification could be that I, I'm not encumbered by a really deep understanding of finance uh, that might get in my way of the questions I ask. Um, I'd just like to say a few comments building upon Peter's very eloquent uh, opening remarks. I think this, this concept of biologic carbon is huge. If you think back on the history of human civilization and what happened when civilizations started developing technology that required energy and started running out of fuel wood, the Oaklands of, of Great Britain, for example, depleted, forcing people to turn to coal, eventually forcing people to turn to petroleum and other forms of fossil fuel, but that's still biological car carbon. It's just dead. It's the ultimate carbon capture and sequestration system, if you would. 70 million years old, at least. And that's today become our problem. But there's a huge, compelling case to be made, as Peter already flagged, that it's living biological carbon that'll help us get out of this mess. The IPCC fifth assessment that came out in 2014. If you look at working group three, the estimate for mitigation is that up to 60% of our climate change mitigation by 2030 will be from land use. In other words, biological carbon. A little fraction of that downward pointing arrow that, that Peter showed. If we look at what's already accomplished, it's biological carbon that's right up in front. The decline of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon, more than four billion gigaton, four gigatons of CO2 emissions reductions avoided. And what's particularly real, and, and that, that's not even talking about the soil carbon that is biological carbon. Uh, a lot of the functions of biological carbon as it's manifested in our crops, in our ecosystems that are not forests. And that gets us, I think, to our agenda today. How do we go from that potential to reality? How do we multiply what's gone on in the Amazon, something we never would have imagined even, even 15 years ago, to make it replicable, to make it go to scale? The basic premise of this workshop is that by adding to a focus on farm level performance, by adding to a focus on what goes on inside the forest concessions, and all of the other more project level uh, uh, approaches that we have that we're used to and comfortable with, if we frame that within landscapes, we can take this to scale. And if those landscapes boundaries correspond with political geographies, with states and provinces and counties and districts, the chances of embedding it in public policy grow much bigger. And those are some of the 
the themes that will come up today in this first opening plenary. I'm going to make very quick introductions because you all have access to everyone's uh, bio online. And we have a great panel today, somewhat challenged in terms of gender balance, but Andrea speaks with great authority and I think she'll carry her own. And she is in fact our opening speaker. Andrea Ledward is the UK board member for the, the Green Climate Fund and head of the Climate Change and Environment uh, Program of DFID. Andrea. Uh, I, and as she's coming up, I'll just say very quickly, every speaker will have us up to about five minutes for comments, quick round of follow-on questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Thank you for the invitation to come. Uh, I was asked to start with a personal story. My job was to work with women to understand their use of uh, forest resources um, to help with the demarcation of a new national park. So I spent many, many months uh, working with women, working with families, trying to understand which of the nuts, which of the, the um, animals, which of the kind of vegetation they needed access to and why, and the commercial benefits, as well as the kind of the social and cultural benefits. And it was... Um, it left an enormous impression on me, and it's very interesting to think about the last 20 years, which have been very much a move from that kind of that micro and that very detailed analysis and anthropologist up to um, today, where, I, as, um, as you said, I sit on the Green Climate Fund board and represent the UK, as well as overseeing the UK's um, climate finance, which over the next five years will be nearly £6 billion. And as part of that, both the GCF and the UK government have got a very clear um, focus on maximising private sector um, leverage and thinking very closely about how we work with the private sector and how we work with a range of other institutions um, internationally. So I'm just going to reflect a little bit on um, some of the priorities from a kind of UK government perspective um, and the GCF, and then I'm happy to take probably more questions on the GCF than, than DFID's perspective um, further on. Um, so essentially, the new climate economy and the Paris NDCs last year told us that um, taking action on land is really essential. So this forum is really a great opportunity to kind of bring together all our different strengths and think about some of the challenges in really ramping up investment in sustainable land use and thinking about optimising the benefits. And it's also very timely because we know that a lot of those nationally determined contributions that were put on the tail at the back end of last year are um, of variable quality. And so the really key challenge now is turning those, um, those, um, those proposals and those propositions into um, projects, into pipelines, and into something that can be invested in, and also credible plans that can be embedded within a country's um, economic growth plan. Uh, we also know that there are significant volumes of private, public, and domestic finance out there. We know that the Economist Intelligent Unit tells us that an extra $2 trillion of um, finance could be unlocked. But the key really for us at DFID is how do we help the finance flow? How do we ensure it brings all the multiple benefits that we want to realize? And really, how do we make our public finance go further? And how do we increase the value for money of the public um, UK finance in particular? So the UK uh, published a new aid strategy at the back end of last year. Um, and it focuses strongly on maximising growth and prosperity, on addressing governance, global peace and security, strengthening resilience in response to crises. And then fourthly, it focuses on extreme poverty and leaving no one behind. So the land use sector is one of the central priorities of our economic development um, work, as well as being at the heart of helping communities to manage risks and build resilience for the future. So I, um, I was going to talk to you, there are six key themes really that we saw in this forum um, that we could speak to as kind of examples. I'm just going to pick three of them. But the six kind of themes that we saw coming through today's agenda, one on strengthening governance, the second on addressing knowledge gaps, the third on innovative financing, the fourth on maximising um, access to global funds, fifth on creating investable opportunities and pipelines, and the final one on leaving no one behind are the six kind of themes that um, I can go into more detail on, but I'm just going to highlight um, three to start with. So the first one is on the strengthening governance, um, which we really see at the heart of all our forestry and land use interventions. 
Um, we work both at the international level and the local level, thinking about trade restrictions, policy reform, tax reform, property rights and tenure, and um, law. So the two um, programmes, just to bring to your attention, are the Forest Governance Markets and Climate Programme, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is looking at the mapping of customary land to protect the rights of forest dependent communities, and then supporting um, some very detailed stakeholder work um, in intensive engagement at a community level. And the second one is a newer programme called LEGEND, it's a Land Governance for Economic Development programme, um, and that's looking at tenure security, particularly for women, um, and supporting then responsible land-based investments. The second one really is then about global funds because we firmly believe that we get the maximum value for our investment if we're promoting the synergies between our bilateral centrally managed programmes and our bilateral investments together with the global um, and thinking about taking them to scale through the global funds. So we, we work closely with IFAD um, and we work there through an adaptation for smallholder agriculture programme. But we also have been very involved over the last few years um, on the design of the Green Climate Fund. And as I'm sure as some of you know, um, the GCF has been mobilised um, and become effective with $10 billion pledged. And we have approved a first set of projects worth $168, billion, $68 million. Um, we'll have another batch of projects through in the board meeting in June. And there's an aspiration to approve kind of $2.5 billion of projects this year, which is still um, an aspiration. And uh, I think the GCF has enormous potential to really show what's possible, to really um, work with a different range of organisations, to have a whole direct access um, side of the business, so it's not just business as usual through some of our international partners, um, and to do business in a really, truly different way with a private sector facility at the centre, also a very strong gender policy right from the word go. Um, but we need everybody to um, kind of engage really at this point and help us through some of the initial conteething problems which I think are evident with, with the GCF at this point. And then the final uh, point just to land on is really this leave no one behind, which is at really at the heart of the government's um, strategy going forward. And some of you may have seen very prominently um, in the global goals. Within that, we believe very strongly about uh, maximising the opportunities for women um, and the most excluded, so those most dependent on forest products, those most dependent on, as indigenous groups, and thinking about how we can link them with markets and access off-farm opportunities, um, and really thinking through those particular lens. So when I um, ran our aid programme in Ethiopia, for example, I would go and visit our safety nets programme, the Productive Safety Nets programme, and that's very much targeted at the most excluded, the hardest to reach, and thinking about how you scale up in times of drought in particular to help the most um, um, hard our hard hit households um, and that was a lot through public works and that's a lot through um, dams through roads through agriculture through farming which is how you build the household and the the community level resilience with women very much at the, the heart of that strategy thank you so, thank you <laughs> next we'll hear from Chris Botsford from ADM capital who'll give us some reflections on his very hands-on work with smallholders Good morning. Um, thank you very much, C4 and the Royal Society for this forum. Um, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in, in Indonesia, um, so apologies if this is Indonesia-centric, um, but I think a, a lot of what we've done applies to, to other places as well. Um, in particular, we've been looking at, at uh, what has been driving deforestation. Now many of the, the palm oil companies and the forest companies have, have taken their bite and, and pretty much remove themselves, primarily because of the efforts of, of everybody campaigning against them. And now it's come down to a lot of the damage being done by smallholders. And when we look at why they're doing it, most of that comes down to poverty. And if, if mm -hmm. take the Indonesian context in the palm oil sector alone of the four million smallholders currently engaged in, in palm oil, about two thirds of them are heavily indebted and one third of them will never ever get out of debt. It's unsustainable debt. So we've got to, we've got to address uh, poverty to start unraveling the rest of the problems. And when we look at it, for example, in Indonesia, the 74,000 villages, uh, 13,000 have no electricity. 
So when we started looking at what we can do to bring capital in to help address this issue, we looked at two main themes. One was bringing electricity to many of these poorer communities. And the second was that what we could do to bring capital to rehabil rehabilitate degraded land. There's in Indonesia about 20 million hectares of degraded, wasted land, and yet people still go and deforest. So if we can bring capital in that can then give an incentive to focus on the degraded land and then make it clear that no capital will be available for degrading uh, currently good land, uh, we think we can get a program going that makes sense. In what we see when we looked about the capital structure of investment, there's plenty of equity around where there really isn't very much money is in the debt. Uh, and most of the banks will lend up to five years, but if you look at most of the reforesting that goes on, if you look at palm oil, cocoa, the crop doesn't produce for five years. So you can't go and make a, a borrow money for five years and expect that to be bankable. It isn't. So we looked at what can we do to bring 10, 12-year money into smallholder finance, into alternative energy in rural areas. And we looked, where is, where is the money? Um, so we consulted with our bankers and, uh, and came across BNP, who said, well, there's plenty of money in places like Japan. In fact, they have negative interest rates. They don't know what to do with their money for 10 years, so they give you less than what you had when you started. So we said, well, if we can get that and bring it into uh, these rural communities, we're doing a good thing. But we need to, to combine this institutional wholesale capital into what are smallholders and very hard to define projects that are quite difficult to bank. And we looked at it and we said, well, if you look at, say, an alternative energy program, you've got two components. One is the bit where it's being built, which is quite high risk. Once it is built, you have an offtake, uh, effectively a cash flow stream coming from the state electricity company. A cash flow stream is effectively a bond. So once we get to that point, we can sell it and I can take the money we've released and put it into the next project. In the, in the case of uh, smallholder land rehabilitation, once the land is planted and you can see the crops coming up, the risk of not having a cash flow stream coming off that lessens every year. Well, you get to a point, even before it begins to, to produce crops, where you're pretty certain it's going to, and you can get to an offset contract, offtake contract, and then securitize that. The next thing is quite a lot of these uh, contracts are quite small, so we need a mechanism that can wrap them up and put them into these wholesale institutions. What's more is a pension fund in Japan actually only invests in yen, whereas the, the people in Indonesia perhaps would tolerate dollars because most of the commodities are, are denominated in dollars, or perhaps they want them in rupiah. So we need swap contracts, and those are institutional contracts. So we work with BNP to come up with an idea where we have, if you like, a warehouse of these, con of these projects once they're, well, while they're being constructed or they're growing product. And then as soon as they get to a point they're bankable, we wrap them up and we sell them off into the institutional market with a swap or whatever it takes to, to bring the institutions in. The program we're looking at initially is a billion dollars for Indonesia alone, but I think it applies, the methodology applies to, to elsewhere. The other question we've had in doing this is, how do you know what's going on in the ground? You know, we've got four million farmers alone in palm oil. How do you know what they're doing with your money? Well, fortunately, the answer is in my pocket. And that is the new software that's coming online makes it totally easy to see what is going on. And there are various companies, Traceall, GeoTraceability, that now have farmer mapping um, software that they can map out. Even if there's no land title, you can do faux land title by very easily mapping around the land. You take one farmer, the next farmer, they will agree where it is. Then the village head agrees. Then the boat party, the district head agrees. Then the governor agrees. Effectively, you've mapped the land. And then you make it clear this land is bankable, and we will make 10, 12, 15 year money available. And, but if we're giving you that money, we expect offset trades, so we expect people to adhere to certain rules. And if you're over here, which is in, in virgin forest or forested areas, there will never be money available to you. So don't even think about going and occupying it because you will remain poor. So you've got that, and, and you've got accountability coming in as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. We're now going to move from a very different perspective, one of a 
federal government, a national government, from the Office of Pre President. Um, Enda Ginting is the Assistant Deputy uh, in the Executive Office of President Jokowi of Indonesia, one of the truly uh, mega tropical forest nations and one of the truly uh, important uh, countries for everything we're talking about in this conference. Enda, thank you. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm from Indonesia, and for those of you who don't know Indonesia and, and you followed it in the newspapers, it's synonymous with problems. Our, our neighbours from Singapore would definitely agree in the recent forest fires. Um, sadly, we as government have often at times been part of the problem. We've allowed different agencies to have multiple maps on Indonesia, therefore killing some of the local actors in the field. Um, we've also allowed people to run around not have land entitlements. Now that's, that's, that's got to change because it doesn't make sense anymore. We're feeling the pressure, we're feeling the international communities talking to us, and more importantly from what Chris said, these app makers, young people like myself who work in the private sector, we're competing with them because they can produce a map of Indonesia, we can't. So that's the pressure we, we're having. Now, moving forward, the white papers mentioned some of the initiatives made by the government. A one map policy, it's not revolutionary, but if you put it in the context of Indonesia, it is amazing. Finally, we're getting a map of Indonesia that looks like the size of Indonesia. <laughs> we're also getting um, land reforms, land entitlements, where you've got the president who bypasses the bureaucracy, bypasses the politician, goes into the indigenous and tribal groups and say, this is your land. Because all this time we've decided to draw a map around your area and say that's land estate, forest estate, when there's a shopping center right in the middle of it. But all that only indicates we're doing a lot, but there's a lot more hurdles in front of us. The ones that we've did in the past and the ones that just naturally there because it's Indonesia. The white paper did mention a lot of the challenges, specific challenges on getting um, international long dated money to investments such as the palm oil in Indonesia, but all that sits on the general problems of doing business in Indonesia. So what are we doing? We're learning from people like um, Chris. We're letting them do what they're doing. And people ask me, why are you not taking the lead? Because there's a trauma. And when people in private sectors, people with money come in and talk and think about the, the idea of working with government, there's a little bit of um, trauma in how much, is, how much government is too much government. So we're learning as we're going through every stage. Are we making a framework, conceptual framework, leg legal issues? Well, for now, no. We're looking for transactions. We're looking for transactions ready to be made, to be tied, because there's money there and there's people here and they need it. And with that, we hope to progress with every transaction, because this is new for Indonesia. The actors there don't know what, how to do it. And we hope that with every new transaction, there's a learning process. And that's when we determine when government comes in as a policy, um, nationwide policy or some little minor tweaks here and there. Because essentially we want to be the enablers. We don't want to be the group of people who stops and restrains the local actors and any good intentions. But we're also learning and that's why we're here. Thank you. Thank you, Enda. You are very, very quick. <laughs> Our next speaker is here from Malawi. Zwide Jeri is the head of the Total Land Care Organization. He'll speak from the perspective of a nonprofit organization that is making that connection between the, the finance community and smallholders on the ground at a large scale. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dan. Um, good morning. Yeah, I am from Malawi, from Southern Africa. Um, I just wanted to, uh, maybe in a way, to assure you that uh, the constituency that I represent is a smallholder production sector. There's a lot of potential there uh, in terms of uh, investments. As you all know that uh, 
it's the smallholder community that is uh, feeding itself in the first place, but it's the same smallholder community that is feeding the whole nation, the global, uh, the global world. So I think there's an opportunity in this uh, meeting that we can look more into how best we can uh, invest in uh, smallholder production. Uh, I'm talking about agro-based as well as natural resource-based products. These are the people that are very efficient in terms of yeah, in terms of producing those things. However, over the last 50 years or plus, both governments and donors uh, have made huge investments um, in free handouts and, uh, and uh, subsidies that uh, have had very low, you know, as you know, impacts, very low returns. And uh, we hear about uh, uh, this fatigue, donor fatigue. But I think that is uh, self-inflicted because we have invested uh, in the things that are really not uh, moving us towards, you know, uh, sustainable development. Our experience really indeed, as, I, as I've uh, alluded to, show that we have huge potential to invest in, in smallholder production. Uh, we have worked on some models. Uh, primarily, we are talking about what is important is to provide access to information, good training for these people. We need to promote uh, green technologies. We need to provide access to, to finance. But also, we need to provide access to markets. Because those two move together. If you want to invest just to provide your money in terms of providing a, a, a loans to farmers, but is not matched by access to markets, then things may not work. So it's very important that uh, we, we match up access to finance and then link uh, smallholder to, to, to markets. Uh, we are working on a model like that, so we, we provide the technologies to farmers. At the same time, we help them to access finance as well as market. Currently, we are working with, uh, uh, we, we, in the last year, we've done a pilot with Opportunity Bank, uh, but we had to use our own revolving fund to provide a guarantee, and then we targeted very few, very few numbers of farmers, 2,000. But the pilot was so successful that the USID was interested, and uh, they are providing um, a guarantee of 7 million. So we are moving from 2,000 to about 13,000 uh, farmers, and uh, also uh, more banks are also interested to, to participate in the, in the program. So this, this is working. And the last year, uh, the recovery was over 98%, uh, despite the fact that these farmers had to pay about 40% interest. They were still interested to do the, uh, the uh, to access the, the uh, uh, agri-finance. So this, this is working. Um, just to emphasize the importance of markets, uh, we had a program at, <coughs> outside Lilongwe where we did a very good uh, uh, program in terms of introducing low-cost irrigation systems. And these farmers moved from producing 20 drum heads in a season to 3,000, one farmer. And so when we took visitors there to say, we want to show you a success story, uh, one of the visitors asked the farmer, how do you look at this new technology? And the farmer said, this technology is very bad. And we got so embarrassed, he said, oh, wait, wait a minute. It's very bad, why? Because I used to produce 20 drum head. I could take 10 on my push bike, sell to the nearby market, and uh, eat the rest or share with my neighbors. Now I'm, I'm stuck with 3,000 drum heads. What do I do with this? <laughs> so we, we, said, we said, yeah, I think the farmer has a point. We need to address the market first before we start talking about production. And if he, as if that was not enough, after three months, these farmers now started making money, and, but they were not paying back the loans. <laughs> okay, so we said, okay, what is the problem? Let's invite both husband and wife to the meeting. And then we introduced the topic. We said, you see, you are not paying. This is the, we have only two months left, and we are going to get the pump or the equipment from you because that was used as a collateral. And the women stood up and said, no, this, this, is, this is not true. Our husband have been telling us that he, they have paid off. We said, no, it's 50%. And the women said, no, 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 this is unacceptable because 
uh, these husbands have been cheating us. And they were saying that right in front of the husband, and the husband were just looking down to say, oh, wait a minute, what is happening? <laughs> so we, we, we have also realized in our, in our program that it's very important to deal with women as well as to deal with the youth. I think the women are very powerful. When I was in a meeting with the UN women in Malawi, I emphasized the point. She disagreed with me, said, Zwide, you are cheating. The women are marginalized. I said, no, I'm a married person. I know how powerful women. She, my wife would not talk in the public, but when we are at home, she's in control. So, so let's, uh, let's really think about women as we are talking about investing uh, in, in, uh, in forest products as well as uh, investing in agro-based uh, enterprises. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Our final comment will be come from Chris Knowles. He's head of, of Climate Change and Environment Division of the European Investment Bank. Chris. So good morning, everybody. Um, somebody has to have a slide. I apologize, it's me. I normally try to avoid it. Um, I wanted this morning to, to give you a little bit of a flavor of what EIB is, a kind of proxy for the wider international community is trying to do to make these connections between farms and funds and forests. Um, you need to keep in mind that we are first and foremost a pretty boring, risk-averse senior lender most of the time. But we do have a strong and a growing commitment to increase our impact on climate mitigation and on the uh, the nexus of, of, of natural resources, natural capital. And we do this through a volume target, 25% of everything we do, which corresponds to about 20 billion euros a year for climate at the moment. We do this through carbon financing, shadow pricing of carbon. We have some class-leading environmental and social standards. We support the new technologies which are going to help some of this happen, including the mobile technologies. We carbon footprint our portfolio, we provide a lot of leadership in the green bond market, and we do all of this basically because this is the direction of travel of international policy um, and of the EU, but frankly, as a long-term financier, we'd be irresponsible not to do so. It's also important to underline um, uh, our, our, our commitment to crowding in the private sector, because again, the numbers are big, the public sector has not got the resources to deal with this, so we do have to work strongly to bring them with us. A word about risk. I think the energy community, the energy investment community, is increasingly used to the idea of carbon stranding risk. You've only got to look at 75% of the American coal industry being in Chapter 11. You've only got to look at the fact that last year renewable energy investment was now bigger than capex in, in, in the oil and gas industries. But I think if we do not stop the degradation of natural resources quite soon, then the agricultural investment community is also going to have to get used to ecological stranding risk. And that, of course, is far more than just an investment issue. If you we're now talking livelihoods, we're now talking food security. If we talk food, as we learn from Marie Antoinette, we're talking revolutions. If we talk livelihoods, we're talking about mass migration, and that's something that in Europe we're very sensitive to these days. So the evidence is that I think the investors and financiers are beginning to see that sustainable financial returns do depend upon sustainable social and environmental practice, but all of this requires integration, it requires joined up thinking, and we're less good at that, to be frank. And the decisions of that community on a voluntary basis will eventually reflect that awareness, but of course it will all happen a lot faster if regulation drives it. I think the disclosure of stranding risk should actually be mandatory um, if we want to start quickly, properly pricing for those risks as investors. But even the largest of investors today do not really have that ability, and so we need entities to coordinate all of this, to bring it together, to aggregate it, as, as, as Chris was saying, and, and to create vehicles to deploy capital so that the big investors can get it down to the projects in Malawi. The good news, I think, is, is that the capital is available. Um, landscapes are, or landscape forestry is dramatically under allocated. You see this on, on, a, on, the, on the graph of our activity there. Uh, the little red circle is what's happening with us in the forestry space. You can't even see it on the graph. Um, it's 200 million a year for us out of 20 billion. Um, the Climate Bonds Initiative has noted that forestry bond issuance is only 2 billion, 
out of a total universe of 600 billion. So way to go. Lots of headroom, but we've got to create the means of, 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 of pulling it through. So over time, we have grown our, our toolkit um, for the natural capital space. Um, we've done so in particular using funds and other SPVs. And these range from mainstream private equity timberland vehicles, um, albeit always with a very strong commitment to sustainable practice. A good example of that is the Dassos timberland vehicle, to more visionary, commercially structured, but still Paripasu vehicles, representatives of some of those people are in the room today often seeded by philanthropic investors and on onwards to private, public, blended vehicles. Um, for example, the LDN fund, which will be talked about later on today, but the Green for Growth, LVL Lifting is in the audience. Um, and also then to plays around these vehicles, which are uh, designed to get to the fixed income market. And that's the holy grail in the investment world. That's where the 90 trillion of, of capital lies, and that's the one we have to crack for this space if we're going to, to scale up. So I'm going to quickly talk about two of these vehicles, if Dan lets me. I can take a couple of the minutes that uh, were kindly left by earlier speakers. <laughs> this is a platform which is all about conservation and environmental protection through innovative financial products and sustainable agricultural commodity production. Very strong emphasis on community development. And I think you know, they would totally agree with what Zvidere was saying about engaging with all parts of the community. And very strong commitment to the socio-economic development of that community. Again, if you don't bring them with you, then especially as international investors, you're, you're toast. The Tambopata National Park uh, is in the Peruvian Amazon Basin around the rather aptly named town of Maldonado. Um, and that's 570,000 hectares of absolutely pristine tropical forest, globally important biodiversity hotspot. But 2,000 hectares a year of that forest is going for all the reasons that we know about and have been studied. Together with a local NGO, Adair, they've got a 20-year concession from the government to implement a conservation plan for that forest. They're going to plant 4,000 hectares of certified high quality cocoa, they're going to put into place all of the marketing infrastructure and the infrastructure to get that cocoa out in a good condition and they're going to avoid half a million tons of CO2 and they're going to create alternate livelihoods for 10,000 people. Apropos of those livelihoods, this is an area which is suffering terribly from illegal gold mining. These are miners, small scale miners who use mercury to refine what they're panning and in doing that very carelessly they are contaminating water, soil, and fisheries in the, Mal in the Madre de Dios River. And they're releasing volumes annually of mercury, which compare to what happened in Minamata in Japan. And this has now reached truly crisis proportions. 40% of the population is now affected, and the government has declared a state of emergency. This gentleman I had the pleasure of meeting on a visit there. It was very moving listening to him explain the changes to his way of life pretty much all of them positive and all of them sustainable. And there are other schemes like this going ahead. The second example, and then I am done, really done, um, in Ecuador, Eco Enterprise Fund. Um, this is basically a growth, uh, SME growth equity fund, mezzanine finance. And these, these SMEs have been chosen for their very strict commitment to ESG standards and their strong emphasis on all the things that I was talking about previously. Runa is again in the Ecuadorian rainforest, servicing the Quichua community and indigenous peoples who've got a taste for something called the gayusa leaf. It's a tea, it's a mild stimulant. And this little SME has got a small processing factory, but has built up a full agricultural extension service. It works with the people in the forest, taking a leaf which is natural from the forest, processing it, packaging it, sending it out to, to hip young people in London and, and New York who are looking for caffeine-free stimulants. They also have a thing called Terra Fertile, which is at the other end of the country, the Altiplano. It's in the area which had the cut flower industry, and the cut flower industry very often comes with horrible practices in terms of water usage and in terms of chemicals. And they have provided an alternative to the people in that industry, small-scale growers of fruit, locally indigenous fruit. They dry this fruit. They export it again to the international community. They are supporting 3,000 smallholders in that area, um, most of them women, and the impact on these communities through women is, is absolutely 
you have to see it to believe it. Um, Eco Enterprise is a story of women, as the firm is also owned and managed by women. Thank you. Thank you. My Chris. apologies for overrunning. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> um, the organizers have generously given us another. 10 minutes to our session, so we have until 10.10. 10. Uh, the first step is going to be some really quick questions um, with maximum 60 second responses, just to make sure you all have some time to get your questions out as well. And Zwide, I want to start with you. You, uh, you and your organization are so inspiring the way you are basically creating those enabling conditions for smallholders to tap into to, uh, to finance. Uh, but also recognizing that it's women running the show, which I have found repeatedly is the case. But could you talk a little bit about your challenges in keeping an innovation organization, which is a, a nonprofit organization, going in this crucial intermediate space? Okay, thanks. Uh, then as I, as I mentioned that, uh, I mean, uh, as an organization, we work with uh, uh, our main uh, constituent is the smallholder community. But at the same time, we work also with other partners. We work with uh, investors. We, we, we work with government. So we are really in the middle there, trying to, to coordinate all that. One, one uh, challenge we face, of course, is the, what I already mentioned is access to markets. Out there on the market, there are unscrupulous business people who are not really offering good prices, they are not transparent to these people. And makes our work very difficult. That's why even sometimes farmers demand that, why don't you also provide this service to us? Because they trust us. So they have trust in us, but they don't have trust in some of the buyers. Uh, the other problem is that the products, the, the commodities that we try to identify and, and define, sometimes it's not done in a more participatory way and uh, the communities are not having a stake there to really uh, understand that some of those products are you know, meeting their multiple needs. It's another challenge we face. Lack of finance, which I already mentioned, is a big thing. I mean, we use, as you know, most of you, that in the past, governments used to provide credit to, to but those things collapsed many years ago. And this, uh, this space has not been filled quickly uh, by the investors because they are there's mention of risk, high risk, and all that. Uh, but I think there are many creative ways of minimizing risk. One of them, of course, is uh, uh, access to insurance. I think there are many insurance companies that are interested, but no one is going to them. We had a meeting in Switzerland with Swiss Lee. They are very keen to, do, uh, to provide uh, uh, insurance to minimize some of, uh, some of the risk. But also more important is the issue of trust itself. Um, I think for us over the years we have created that trust. That's why farmers want us to provide credit. They want us to, to, be, to buy things from them. They want us to provide, to provide uh, inputs because when they go to the market to buy inputs, they find this, they are getting the wrong product there. So the trust is very important between the investor on one hand, us boots on the ground that we are you know, uh, providing the link with, between smallholders and the other service provider. That trust is very critical. I think we have really to work around that, how to bring that trust. Because I can tell you, most of us feel we don't trust these people. But in the majority of cases, they are the ones that really don't trust us. So we need to work at that. We, we have some homework to do on that. Thank you I, very much. I could add a touch on, on the trust issue that uh, for the small holders, independent smallholders in Indonesia, they had a terrible issue there that the seeds they were planting were counterfeit well, you don't find out for four years, and that's, that's contributed a lot to the poverty. And that's about one third of independent smallholders planting uh, palm uh, trees that are actually uh, substandard and yield perhaps one quarter of what they should have done if they put the right seed in. But it's a big issue. Next, I want to turn to Enda. And and uh, it's very interesting some of the things you're saying about how much government is too much government. You seem to have some really strong ideas on what a good partnership looks like. What is your message to the finance community in terms of what you need in your job to make investment deals work work for Indonesia? Thank you. I think um, for us, for government, it's, uh, especially government of Indonesia, it's challenging to define how to work with the, uh, the private sector, the financing. But at this, I guess. Uh, there's no way, there's no other way around it except to be upfront, honest, and about 
what it is it requires to get some of these business processes in place. Um, and the government's still learning how to do that. And we're tailing on the existing in initiatives, such as from the ADM Capital. And we're also learning when we can come in, when we can't, because what we often find is uh, actors and non, not the good ones are happy to reclassify some of their transactions and say this would fit into that criteria because there's no proper base for a government to sit and say, well, that doesn't make sense, this that makes sense. Because absence of that data is just crazy. But I guess for um, the investors out there, I'd suggest spend time in, in getting to know how to get how to get the business process, how to get transactions running, and how to understand how things get run in Indonesia. Because we talk about small, small, small shareholders, and we don't even know who they are. And you had we have Chris to come in to different parts of Indonesia, where I've never been moving to, and actually meet the people and talk to them. And they're the one who brings in the information, the wealth to us. And we say, we make a judgment on how, how, how can we make this possible. And um, we originally found 200,000 hectares, cut down take away the ones that land uh, that, that don't have certificate that are not legally acknowledged 150,000 hectares take out the ones that are not involved in existing palm oil um, uh, off takers 120,000 and then take out the ones that we can actually identify then we're left with 75,000 and then there's a lot of that screening in that that's a lot of work for us but that indicates it's 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 a market that's not saturated it's um, it's it, a lot of pre-work needs to be done. Thank you. <clears throat> Andrea, you gave us already some of the highlights of where the Green Climate Fund is. I wonder if you could, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to me just how high the expectations are. And uh, what are the appropriate expectations? What is the GCF going to look like if it hits its full potential five years from now? So I think it's important to remember that the GCF is not the answer to the 100 billion, which I think some people make the mistake of equating the 100 billion with the Green Climate Fund. The, the GCF is never going to be mobilizing 100 million, 100 billion dollars, sorry, as a single institution. The GCF will be one um, part of the international architecture. So the critical thing really is understanding what the specific and unique role of the GCF is alongside um, the rest of the multilateral development banks, alongside the private sector, alongside um, the Global Environment Facility, alongside the Climate Investment Funds, and alongside a lot of bilateral um, activity. And I think it's understanding where the particular niche is. It, it clearly has a mandate around paradigm shifting and mobilizing financing at scale, which many others have not been able to do to date. Um, and it also has a very explicit mandate around um, the private sector facility and getting private sector financing to flow. And in particular, there's a kind of almost proof of concept around um, private sector financing and adaptation, I think, where, again, the GCF is different because it's got a 50-50 adaptation mitigation um, aspiration. And I think we've, we saw in the figures that came through pre-Paris that um, the adaptation financing was only about 16% of the overall climate finance flow. So to go to, from 16% of climate finance up to 50% is, is a very big paradigm shift, actually, to show what's possible and to show that finance can flow. It also has a very different mandate around direct access and around country ownership. So again, I think in five years' time, if you were judging success, it would be about the, the GCF having kind of built national capability that looks and feels different. So you have national designated authorities that are having um, ownership of very strongly embedded country plans that are able to access funds directly. And if you see the example um, of Fenewa in Rwanda, or you see the example of the Ministry of Finance in Ethiopia, to um, leading kind of national organizations that are both accredited to the GCF, I think we would hope that there would be other examples, that there wouldn't be just a kind of a, a very small handful, that there'll be others that are showing what's possible in terms of accessing those funds and then owning these kind of national plans. So I think there's something definitely about the national capability, about the private finance flowing around the GCF within the architecture and kind of finding a more stable footing, um, particularly understanding where it's subsidizing and where it's kind of point of um, investment should be and one on what terms the GCF should be investing, which I still think we have to work that through, and there'll be some teething problems as we kind of work out what the right um, level of risk appetite is for the GCF in particular, which is really at the nub of the problem um, for many, which is so we're not over-subsidising the private sector in particular, but we're kind of unlocking finance at scale, and that's very difficult to do um, in the absence of a lot of projects on the table, and we have a very, um, we don't have a strong pipeline at the moment. 
So we need others to kind of have confidence that the GCF can mobilise at scale and bring forward kind of quality programming. Thank you. Chris Knowles, what would it take to get that miserly, miserly little one billion a year up to 20? <laughs> it's worse. 200 it's, two, million, it's 200 sorry. million a year. <laughs> it was one billion for the last five years. Um, I think it's an evolutionary thing. You know, we have, we have been busy in this space for well over a decade now, and we've seen good growth on the energy efficiency and the renewable energy side, and, and interesting models are beginning to flow through in that space now, but the natural resource space isn't there yet, and I think it's partially there was a, a slower awareness amongst the wider community. I know the specialists have all been very conscious of this for many years, but maybe their message wasn't percolating out as much as widely as it ought to. Um, I think that you know that awareness is now coming, but we've then now also got to to to, to work to find the models to deploy the capital. Uh, you know, if you take the case of EIB, myself and my two colleagues sitting over there, you've got most of our front office for this space. 160 countries we try to be active in. You can do the math. So we have to do this with partners, um, and we want to do it with partners. We believe that working with the private sector is essential for the capital reason I talked about, but it's also important because that's how we can get the specialized knowledge, the local knowledge, the on-the-ground knowledge, the boots on the ground. Um, there's no reason for you know this all to be done on, on, on our payroll. I think we do much better and we'll scale it up much more quickly with partners. But the simple answer that we don't yet we haven't yet found uh, enough of these partners and enough of these models. Um, you saw a list of some of the people we are working with. Uh, for that list, uh, you know, we've looked at another 15 or 20, which we didn't succeed in working with. Um, but I hope that uh, if we're sitting down here in another two or three years' time, we'll have a much longer list. Uh, yeah. I need you. I need you, Sundar, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> but that's, basic, that's basically it. We need, we need partners. We need models for the aggregation, for the risk sharing, for the structuring, for the, for the boot work on the ground. And finally, Chris Botsford, could you just carry out a little bit for us what that scenario looks like with the mapping? I mean, with coming to formal uh, recognition, perhaps within the constitutional court um, decision on customary lands, but also independent smallholders. What are the next steps for that? How does that go to scale in Indonesia? Uh, well, as Anderson uh, and, uh, touched on, the, uh, yeah, there are a lot of different maps in Indonesia, and the, the Ministry of Mines has one, the Ministry of Forests have one, and, and each party has one, and the villages have one. And it, a lot, of, a lot of overlaps need to be settled. So you need from the top down, which is where we need the government to come in and help, and then you need the bottom up. At the village level, um, what goes on in, in, for example, Kalimantan is that every uh, migrant is entitled to two and a half hectares, and when it goes wrong in one village, they move to the next village and get another two and a half hectares. It's not quite so easy, but that's broadly what goes on. And even if they're not awarded, they just take it. So if you can start by getting everybody's two and a half hectares mapped on, on a software package that then is totally transparent to everybody, and everybody that is buying product is looking at where exactly did this product come from, then we begin to look at, well, if the surplus product, where did that come from? And why are you buying it? Because that's probably uh, contributing to deforestation. And so if you're beginning to get this uh, faux title, it doesn't have to be legal title, but it's actually the commercial enterprises that are forcing that title on people. And if it's accepted at a village head level, at a both party level, and a governor level, it very soon becomes law, even if it's not internationally approved as that is land title. It is effectively land title, because out in Kalimantan, what else is there? So that's what we're trying to do, is to get common agreement on what title looks like. Great. Thank you very much. Folks, I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> and uh, surprise, surprise. Just to wrap up, though, and uh, a great conversation. I, first, I want to just give a round of applause to our panelists. You know, some of the emergent issues here are, are really the, you know, I think last year we heard a lot about bankable projects and the scarcity of bankable projects. A very interesting sort of counter perspective presented here is what 
what the, the nations where the change is taking place need from the investment co community for this to go forward. I think the whole idea that the GCF is going to help usher in a, a new paradigm and, and a new type of institution in the countries that are participating in, in the low carbon land use agenda is huge. Uh, the critical role for non-governmental actors that are innovation partners and in helping in that aggregator function uh, I think is another really big message we had today and, and throughout all of this it really gets down to building the trust so these relationships can, moving, can move forward. In closing, I'd like to refer back to a trip I made a couple weeks ago in the spirit of telling stories to the state of Acre in the far southwestern corner of the Brazilian Amazon. For, well, for the last 18 years, Jorge Viana and then Binho, Governor Binho, and now Governor Chiang Viana have been building upon the legacy of Chico Mendes, uh, a low carbon land use economy. And what really struck me with this last visit is how relevant many of the lessons there are to the dialogues here in London, where there's now about 40 million uh, in private investment, all from Brazilian investors, attracted by a smaller amount of public investment from ANAC, an agency specialized in attracting that investment. And these are public-private community partnerships. If there's not an upside for the low-income participants uh, in the adventure, it doesn't move forward. And that is a commitment of the government, which has created the enabling conditions for this to go to scale across a 170,000 square kilometer landscape, which is a state. Uh, we now have an opportunity to import some of that into Mato Grosso, uh, at the other end of the Amazon. But I guess the point I want to leave with is, this agenda is moving forward. It's moving forward fast. There's innovation. A lot of our challenge is to connect the dots and make sure that this is a multiple dialogue flowing with information and ideas flowing in multiple directions uh, instead of in one direction. So thank you again for your patience today. Thank you.